The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, I'm Thomasina Burkhardt with Region 10, and I'm here to present a training over elements of expository writing as part of the secondary writing webinar series. This webinar is recorded and will be accessible via a link I will provide at the end of the uh, webinar along with any handouts and resources. This workshop has been designed because many secondary students struggle with expository writing for both classroom purposes and state assessment purposes. To allow students the opportunity to develop a comprehension of the expository writing expectations, this webinar was created to equip teachers with the foundational elements and skills students need in order to engage them so that learning is, is accessible to them. Throughout the webinar, if you are unclear about an activity or have a question related to an activity, please type the question and I will respond at an appropriate time. I hope you enjoy this webinar and find the information and activities useful for your classroom instruction. This workshop is designed to explore the elements of expository writing, how those elements align with state standards, and practical classroom application strategies to use in order to help students embed the elements in both reading and writing of expository text. The goals for today's trainings are to understand what the elements of expository text are, compare the state standards, expository writing rubric expectations, and expository elements, along with exploring practical classroom strategies to use when teaching the elements of expository text with both reading and writing. In Module 1, we will explore the elements of expository text. An expository essay is a multi-paragraph essay that conveys information about a topic. The number of paragraphs is not predetermined. The essay includes a beginning, a middle, and an end. The writer explains, describes, and informs the reader about a topic by using facts, details, and examples in a clear and concise way. For the next several slides, I will provide an overview of the seven elements of expository writing. The thesis is typically stated in the first paragraph of the expository essay. To narrow the focus or topic, writers need to determine which aspect of a topic they will write about. For example, if the topic is music, the writer needs to ask, what kind of music? Then the writer can ask, what do I want my readers to know about that kind of music? Common approaches for developing a thesis or controlling idea statement include the following. Making, make a connection. This is when you compare your topic with something you learned or studied in class or know a lot about. Consider making a connection that reader, the reader might not normally make. Refute an accepted idea presents new evidence or interpret existing evidence in a new way. Finding something new looks at a topic from a new perspective. Think of an aspect that has been overlooked. Defining um, introduction offers, excuse me, a thesis offers a definition of a key term that will get readers to see a controversial issue in a new way. When you evaluate using a thesis statement, you make an assessment about something's quality or utility. A thesis statement can also argue cause and effect. This explains how something happened or will happen because of something that was done. And lastly, a thesis may propose a change, suggest something that something needs to be done that has never been tried before. Expository essays need an introduction that grabs the reader's attention. The introduction should show why the reader, writer's ideas are worth considering and provide a brief overview of the topic. Common ways to introduce expository essays include the following. Solve a problem. Problem solving will almost always grab your reader's attention, especially in an academic context. It is also a good way to set up your thesis statement, which will then help the reader better understand it. 
This type of introduction can set up your conclusion by allowing you to return to the problem and show how the things you wrote solve the problem or that the problem needs further inquiry. When you start with an anecdote, a quotation, a question, or an interesting fact, this form of introduction often will appeal to a reader's emotions. Interesting anecdotes, quotations, questions, and facts can quickly interest readers and make them want to read more. Try to think of an interesting, shocking, or weird fact about your topic. Acknowledging what others have said about the subject. For some topics, the amount of literature available can be overwhelming. If you're writing about a popular topic, it is best to acknowledge in your introduction that much is already written on that subject. Your introduction needs to convey why your essay is important and how it is different from all the other literature that already exists on the subject. You may point out an irony or a paradox. Paradoxes are seemingly contradictory statements. They are great to use in introductions to get the reader's attention. You may try using an analogy in your introduction. If your topic is a bit obscure or abstract, try connecting it to something more familiar to your reader. And lastly, jumping into the content is good for audiences who do not like to read anything they do not have to. Sometimes it can be more dramatic to start with your thesis. Supporting details explains the thesis and the topic. Details should be specific, add substance to the essay, and presented in a logical, organized way. Writers may use their own unique experiences or view of the world as the basis for writing or to connect their ideas in interesting ways. Details are often brainstormed before the author begins to write. These supporting details help the writer to determine the main points or ideas in an essay that support the thesis and which organizational structure would best suit the topic. Types of supporting details include examples, facts and statistics, reasons, causes and effects, incidents, definitions, comparisons and contrasts, or steps in a process. Oftentimes I have found that students do not know the different types of supporting detail. We must teach them the different types and what they actually mean. They should be able to identify the different types in reading and be able to use the different types when writing. Supporting details are often then grouped into categories based on commonalities. The groupings or categories typically become the main points or ideas that the writer will fully explain in the essay. Each paragraph should be limited to the explanation of one general idea. Writers should focus on the thesis. Writers should include paragraphs, no set number, that have topic sentences directly related to the thesis and details that present the following main ideas to develop or support the thesis statement, evidence from the text, these can be embedded quotations, to support these ideas, including examples, illustrations, statistics, and so forth. And finally, analysis of the evidence and central ideas in which the writer integrates his or her own ideas, values, beliefs, and assumptions. The type of evidential support, whether factual, logical, statistical, or anecdotal, varies. Because students are often required to write expository essays with little or no preparation, essays may not have a great deal of statistical or factual evidence. Writers should include enough details to fully explain each piece of information. Writers should also try to show and not tell. They should not assume that the reader has prior knowledge or understanding of the topic. Writers should use words that clearly explain and describe in detail rather than just state ideas. Writers should try to leave no reader question unanswered. Writers should keep their writing interesting and not focused on the formulaic nature of expository writing. The goal should be to leave readers with a better understanding and lasting impression. There should be no inconsistencies or extraneous information. The details should support the main points or ideas to fully explain the thesis statement. Expository essays need an organizing structure that logically presents the main ideas and supporting details related to the thesis statement. Writers should select the structure that is best suited to a thoughtful and engaging explanation of the topic. Common expository organizational patterns include the following. Concept and definition, sequence, compare and contrast, 
cause and effect, problem and solution. When using different organizational structures from paragraph to paragraph, the writer also should use meaningful transitions and strong sentence-to-sentence -sentence connections to enhance the logical movement of the essay and clearly show the relationships among ideas, making the writer's train of thoughts easy to follow. For the next few slides, we will review the main types of graphic organizers used with expository text. We will now put a visual with the text structure type and its definition. For concept and definition, this generally describes a topic by listing characteristics, features, and examples. Sequence lists items or events in numerical or chronological order. Compare and contrast explains how two or more things are alike and or how they are different. You could also use a Venn diagram for this as well. Cause and effect list one or more causes and the resulting effects. Problem and solution states a problem and lists one or more solutions for the problem. A variation of this pattern is the question and answer format in which you pose a question and then you answer it. The conclusion should not simply restate the thesis, but rather readdress it based on the evidence provided. Because this is part of the essay that will leave the most immediate impression on the reader, it should be effective and logical. Writers should not introduce new information in the conclusion. Rather, writers should synthesize and resolve the information already presented in the body of the essay. Writers may use many types of, uh, excuse me, Writers use many types of conclusions. Below, uh, we have a list of ideas for bringing closure to an essay. Writers can incorporate more than one of these types in a conclusion. Some common types may include a summary, which sums up all of your main points. This is the most basic and popular type of conclusion. But be careful not to repeat your thesis. Sometimes writers may use a link to back to the beginning. This type of conclusion of conclusion is a nice companion for an introduction that features anecdotes, quotes, problem solving, and so forth. Tying the end to your beginning gives readers a satisfying sense of closure. You might refer back to a certain image or phrase in your introduction. Keep in mind that this method works best in some essays more than others. In other words, if you try too hard to connect your conclusion to your introduction, it may come off as contrived and artificial. Looking at the larger context and using this as a type of conclusion, this is good for obscure and abstract topics for which the details cause readers to lose sight of the main point. This type of conclusion reminds your readers of the big picture by answering the following question. Why does my topic matter? What are the consequences of what I am suggesting or proposing? And lastly, students may use a call to action conclusion. This is a common approach for proposal essays that ask your reader to respond to your position or argument with a specific action. And we generally see that type of conclusion in persuasive writing. The writer's word choice in an expository essay should be accurate, concise, clear and concrete. Effective word choice reflects a keen awareness of the expository purpose and maintains a tone appropriate to the purpose and the audience. Writers often focus on word choice to improve their first drafts. To improve writing, writers can replace overused words with stronger, more powerful ones or use phrases and sensory details that describe, explain, or provide additional details and connections. The word choice sets the tone for the essay. Sentences are the building blocks of writing. The way sentences are constructed affect the fluency or the flow of the writing. Expository essays are enhanced when the writer uses purposeful sentences that are varied in both length and structure. Examples of how writers can vary sentences to improve their writing include the following. Using a variety of sentence patterns, including simple, compound, and complex sentences. Combining short sentences with prepositional phrases, appositive phrases, or participial phrases. 
combining short sentences by linking items of equal importance with a coordinated conjunction. Combining short sentences containing ideas that are unequal importance with a subordinating conjunction. Starting sentences in different ways, for example, with an adverb, with a prepositional, participle, or infinitive phrase, or with an introductory clause. Or you could just simply break up long rambling sentences, often run-on sentences, into two or three shorter sentences. Now, to recap the seven expository elements, they include clear, concise, and defined thesis, clearly organized structure, strong introduction, specific supporting details, strong conclusion, purposeful and precise word choice, and varied sentence structure. In Module 2, we will look at and compare the elements to that of the reading standards, writing standards, as well as the expository writing rubric. We have to look at the big picture of how everything is connected in order to create more alignment in our instruction. In addition to looking at the alignment, we will look at how students are assessed in both reading and writing in order for students to be able to see the reading-writing connections. This will help us, as teachers, to stop doing double duty when planning, but most important, importantly, it prevents our students from doing double duty. They will begin to understand that whatever they read was written first and that writing was purposely done using specific elements. For this module, we will only focus on the standards in grades 7 and English 1, but the alignment can be done at all secondary grade levels. Let's look at the element of a defined thesis. The language of thesis is pretty clear in regards to how it's coined in the expository elements, the expository scoring rubric, and the writing standards columns. As educators, we must understand the language of thesis in reading. I will give you a moment to read over the standards in order to compare. Now I'll give you a moment to review a few of the questions that have addressed these standards over the last several years. Think about how these questions can help guide students' understanding of a thesis or controlling idea when composing an expository essay. Okay, hey, let's look at the element of organizing structure. The pretty clear across, excuse me, of organizing structure is pretty clear across all columns. So often we have our students map out the organizational patterns of paragraphs in expository uh, text, but we don't have them organize the patterns in each of the paragraphs they write for expository essays. Just as the organizational patterns may change from paragraph to paragraph in their reading, the same is true for their writing. We cannot just hand our students one graphic organizer and expect that that to be the end all for helping to organize their expository essay. That is an elementary writing strategy, not a secondary writing strategy. We need to give our students multiple graphic organizers in order to choose from and let them know that the choices they make is determined by the purpose of that paragraph. I will give you a moment to read over the standards in order to compare.
Now we'll give you a moment to review a few of the questions that have been addressed that address these standards over the last several years. You will see that the revising and editing questions generally ask students to reorganize sentences in a paragraph to match the overall organizing structure of that paragraph. Think about how these questions can help guide students' understanding of, an or, of organizing structures when composing an expository essay. Now, for strong introductions, you will notice that it is not ex an explicit area addressed on the expository scoring rubric or in the reading standards. That does not negate the fact that students need to know and understand how to compose introduction paragraphs in an expository essay. Remember, STAR is not the end all for student writing. That is just one day and one snapshot of a student's writing. The student needs to know how to write introductions for expository essays beyond that one four to five hour block out of that student's life. I say that wholeheartedly because we have our students for an average of 1,260 hours in a school year. That day of star of writing for STAR is just a minute section of time out of that child's life. Now, I will give you a moment to review a few of the questions that have addressed these standards over the last several years. Think about how these questions can help guide students' understanding of writing a strong introduction when composing an expository essay. Now, let's look at the element of supporting details. The language of supporting details is pretty clear across all columns. I will give you a moment to review the standards. Now, for these questions, what you are unable to see is the type of supporting details written throughout the text. It is our job to go back and review the types of supporting details writers commonly use when composing expository text. I will give you a moment to look over some of these question stems from the reading and the revising and editing portions of uh, our state assessments. Now, just as with the strong introduction, you will notice that strong conclusions is not an explicit area addressed on the expository scoring rubric or in the readings 
standards. And again, this does not negate the fact that students need to know and understand how to compose introduction, I mean, conclusion paragraphs and an expository essay. Remember, STAR is not the end all for student writing. That is just one day and one snapshot of that student's writing. Although we do not have a writing standard that directly addresses a strong conclusion, I managed to find one question from the reading uh, question stems. Remember, this is different from drawing conclusion questions. Those types of questions are requiring students to take information and come up with a logical explanation to a situation or event. For this particular strong conclusion, we are looking at the conclusion paragraphs of the essay and analyzing how the information in the paragraph was a strong summation of the overall intent of the message from the selection. We are looking at the quality of writing for this particular element. Take a moment to review. Purposeful word choice is evident throughout all of these columns. The word choice sets the tone for the reading or the writing. It helps to determine the message and the feeling we want the audience to have. Oftentimes, our word choice will tap into either the audience's emotional side, their logical side, or their ethical side. For each of these, the writer wants the audience to have either a positive or negative viewpoint or feeling regarding the subject or topic. Take a few moments to review how word choice has been addressed in both reading and writing. Think about how these questions can help guide instruction to increase student understanding of purposeful word choice. Although varied sentence structure is addressed in all columns, you will notice that the language in the reading standards is not as obvious. On the next slide, you will see how reading questions on the assessment address this standard. Take a few moments to review the standards. As you will notice in the reading questions, students are not asked directly about simple, complex, or co compound sentences. The expectation is that students use these types of sentences in their writing, but that they learn to use them with a twist in order to add more sophistication. They need to know how to use a fragment for a specific effect, not because students are unaware of how to compose a complete sentence. 
Within their variant types of sentences, the students need to know how to use them in quotations, with figurative language, to state opinions, and also to use them in an aside. Most people think an aside is only used in drama. We need to teach our students not only what an aside is, but also its purpose and how we can use it in different genres of writing. Learning to use simple, complex, and compound sentences in order to craft a specific message is the, mainly how students are assessed with varying sentence structures in reading. For progression of ideas and transitions, you will notice that this is not an expository element, but it is a criteria of writing that students need to know how to use consistently and effectively and is necessary for a coherent essay. This criteria is a basic communication element that students use in order to express their thoughts in order to make their writing coherent and transition with purpose. Without using this criteria and using it effectively, the communication of the writing sounds like gibberish. Progression of ideas and transitions is probably the hardest to teach. It's the most complicated. It's the place where more people have misunderstandings, but it's more important to teach them about moving logically from sentence to sentence and connecting their ideas. Meaningful transitions clarify relationships between sentences, between paragraphs, between ideas. You may as well not teach perfunctory transitions because it doesn't make any difference. Perfunctory transitions absolutely have no function. Saying first of all, second of all, finally of all, that's fourth grade. What's the purpose of this transition? It works exactly like grammar. Punctuation is the road sign for the reader to negotiate the sentences and know how to read those sentences without the writer sitting right there giving them this how to read this, this paper. Transitions do the same thing. They're a signpost that move you from section to section on the road. It's like the airport straight ahead sign. You know you're on the right road. You're making connections. The reader has to really follow, easily follow, not work hard to follow. Not saying, hmm, I think I know what this kid is saying. Maybe, not that. Because when a reader says that, we don't have a good enough transition. Transitions are hard. They're not just conjunctive adverbs. They can be, but not always. Sometimes they are phrases or sentences. There are lots of different ways to do it. We have to figure out a better way to scaffold the teaching of transitions. I usually separate paragraphs and have students tell me how each one is connected to the other. The way students make that connection is how I teach them to write a transition phrase or sentence. Take a few moments to look at some of these sentences. Thoughtful and engaging is another criteria that is not a specified expository element. The thoughtfulness slash individuality is part of the development. When you see it, how do you know it? This means the student's presence is in the writing itself, the face behind the writing. This is where you can see the kid, get a real sense of who the kid is. Even in one page, you can get a good sense of that face that ends up being the kid, kid's personal thinking and feelings about that particular task or topic thinking about both the purpose and the task. This, the writer has a good understanding of the purpose, a good understanding of the expository writing, a good understanding of that topic. It's purpose plus topic always. It really is not guessing, but the way he developed the piece, how well he can explain it, how well he can respond to this topic. It also has to do with the kid's presence or face. How come more original, um, and individualistic writing is more engaging. It's because you can really see the person's face and get a sense of what that person thinks and understands about the topic.
Statements that include opinions or the writer's take on a subject offer an insight into the writer's mind. This leads to thoughtful and engaging writing. As teachers, we must pay careful attention to how we are showing our kids how to embed their opinions into their writing, showing them how to discern between both substantiated and unsubstantiated opinions is crucial. Other ways to create a thoughtful and engaging piece may be to look at the subject in an unconventional way or even explaining a topic or subject in an alternate point of view. There are many ways to grab the audience's attention and bring them into the writing. As skilled readers, we need to look at a few expository pieces we have read, the ones we enjoyed, and write down the different reasons we enjoyed that piece. This will help us develop a bank of ways to teach our students how to write more thoughtful and engaging essays. Lastly, the command of sentence boundaries is another criteria that is necessary for our students to communicate effectively, but does not fall under the realm of an expository element. We don't necessarily see this addressed in our reading standards either, but we witness its presence when we read a well-written text. For each grade level, specific command of sentence boundaries will emphasize specific grammar and conventions that need to be addressed for more effective and sophisticated writing. For Module 3, we will explore classroom practices for using the elements in both reading and writing. Now, one practice I like to use when exploring the elements with students is using paragraph excerpts. This excerpt is from uh, Something to Howl About by Michelle War. This particular excerpt is an introduction paragraph. I use excerpts and have only one excerpt per page, printed out just as you see it here. Same type font, same size, everything the same. This introduction excerpt is used for analyzing thesis statements, strong introductions, purposeful word choice, varied sentence structure, sentence-to-sentence -sentence progression, as well as transitioning to the next idea in the reading. I tend to color code the excerpts for organization purposes and either laminate each one or place in a sheet protector. This is done so that students can interact with the text but also it is a quick formative assessment for me to visually see how well students are understanding identifying the elements as we're working with them. This is a middle school text. Um, this activity, same type concept using one paragraph. This is a body paragraph. And what I usually do is this helps guide students in creating an anchor chart or it can also be used as an analysis tool for uh, teachers in which students can uh, use small group jigsaw or gallery walk. These are some of the questions I may use to guide the activity. What idea is presented in the passage? What relevant information is provided about the idea? What added value does this information provide? How are the sentences connected? What are the relationships between sentences? Do the sentences show cause and effect? problem solution, compare contrast, descriptive, or sequential details. Students need to know that the way sentences are connected, they usually follow some kind of structure as well, because that is how the paragraphs end up being structured. Are these connections logical and do they make sense? What transitional words or phrases does this author use to connect sentences or ideas? These do not have to be formal transitional words or phrases, but a means of connecting the sentences to one another. What sentences are repeated or paraphrased? What feelings or thoughts about each paragraph are included? Now this is from a published piece, but sometimes I actually take student writing samples, retype them up in the same format to use for not only reading, but also writing and revision purposes. Another activity you can do is to create task card activities for each
practice. Use an excerpt similar to great pieces to use. You don't want anything too long or daunting when students are first working with identifying Remember, the focus for the activities is in this module is to help build practices for bridging the reading and writing in order for students to see that reading and writing work together, hand in hand rather than separately. Another tool that I feel you will get the most bang for your buck for is to show students how to identify the different types of supporting details using a graphic organizer format. I've laid out nine types of supporting details, but you may want to, your students to focus on only three or maybe six types. The point is for you to purposefully teach the different types of supporting details in order to formatively assess which ones your students are most comfortable with. If they're unable to identify these different types of supporting details, then they will surely not be able to use them effectively in their writing. When I originally designed the supporting details brainstorming tool, I designed it for writing, but quickly realized how it was just as effective for reading text and identifying types of supporting details. Just to note that if you decide to use a tool such as this, I also found it quite useful to create a desk anchor chart of definitions for students to use as a reference guide. The supporting details of focus should be explicitly taught to students prior to them using this brainstorming tool. After students have identified the types of supporting details, they need to then understand how the author has organized these details in the paragraph. The author used those supporting details and structured them in a particular manner for a specified purpose. What was the author trying to get the reader to understand about the topic through the use of supporting details? Once again, we cannot take for granted that our students have a firm understanding of text structures. If our students have a firm grasp of text structures, then they would not struggle so much with understanding author's purpose, especially as it relates to expository text. Creating an anchor chart for reference is a perfect tool to guide students in understanding both text structures and author's purpose. In a chart like this, they also need to understand which graphic organizer matches up to each text structure. For Module 4, we will focus on implementing these elements into student writing. So, looking at from theory to practice, we've now looked at all the supporting details and we've used the brainstorming and categorizing brainstorming tool for reading. Now we can see how this can actually apply for writing as well. Once the students have developed their own idea, which you can see on this example, says idea number one is written at the top, then you would have the students identify different types of supporting details that could support that idea. Words or phrases are used. These are not written in sentence form. This can be conducted in small individual settings. The whole point is just to get the kids to start brainstorming different types of supporting details. All of the blocks do not need to be filled, but it also allows you as a teacher to see what type of supporting details are my students using to support their ideas. Are they only uh, relying on a couple of them, or are they using a variety of different types of supporting details? It's important for me to understand this. Once the students have written down as many supporting details as they could, can, I then have them put stars beside the ones that they feel like both I mean, most closely relate to one another because those are the ones we would probably want to use for our essay. So, as I was developing this tool, what I found, first of all, the problem. What was the prevailing problem for this to even go on? It was the idea the students were not developing their ideas. They're in their supporting ideas, 
and non-development of ideas is causing students not to receive threes and fours on their star writing. That was the big picture. So, I can tell students about the supporting details all day long, but what I decided to do is I decided to provide a visual tool that would help them see the various types of supporting details and visually see how much support they are providing for an idea. I only use one of these sheets per idea. Each idea gets a whole new sheet. So, I looked at the different types of supporting details listed in the expository elements. And what I decided is the supporting details that are relevant for students I work with. Those are the types of supporting details that I would actually add to this. So if, it's, if you don't feel comfortable using incidents, then I probably would not have your kids with a chart that had incidents on there. I didn't want students to focus on a lot of wordiness right now. I wanted them to focus on the information. They should only use words or phrases. Everything should fit in this box. I have them list as many of these supporting details as they can. Some boxes may go unfilled. That's perfectly fine. I will be able to see who is having problems with supporting details. Those who are having problems, I can have a mini writing conference with them. After they list as many details as possible, I then have them put a star beside the supporting details that relate in some way. Obviously, if they have problems listing the details, then that means their paper will also have problems. So before they even get to any line paper, this is what I'm looking for. How are they supporting that idea? So, I next, go, I next look at, since students just randomly list information in the box, how is that going to help their paper? Because as we see, things are just randomly listed. So I will have them review everything to star beside all of that supporting details as they relate. Then they will just have to accept the fact that everything will make it to their paper. I allow them to conference with their peers with the purpose. They should be able to tell their peers how their star supporting details are related because a lot of times they feel like they're related, but they're not able to explain it. So we're still having these talking tools going on prior to any writing going on. So now that we've looked at all these thought processes, now it's time to look at the thinking processes of how this is going to actually help them organize their writing. So I have them look through the different graphic organizers to determine the best structure to explain. So they have to figure out what topic they're writing about in a paragraph and what is the purpose for explaining that topic. So once they use that graphic, I mean, once they choose that graphic organizer, I have them. Uh, I have them transfer their start information to that graphic organizer. So, as I stated, they're just transferring all of their start information from the brainstorming tool, and they've transferred it now to this graphic organizer that will serve as the purpose to explain the particular idea for their paragraph. During this transfer, the supporting details are randomly placed on the chart. As you will notice, I have numbered them after the transfer. This number is a sequence to how I, would like, how I would like to see this information presented in the essay. So they've used the brainstorming tool, they put a star beside a related content, now they're transferring it over to a graphic organizer. Once they've transferred it, now they're sequencing how that information would be presented. I will then either provide them with another graphic organizer, the same one, or they can actually create their own graphic organizer. But now, they're going to take that information, that sequenced information, and they're now going to put it in a more cohesive fashion. Everything is now going to be written in sequence, along with combining any kind of ideas or sentences. Excuse me, any kind of thoughts or sentences. So we've gone from this to this. So we've really looked at the meats and potatoes of the essay. But we still need to figure out how we're going to even introduce these ideas. So provide tools to help students develop strong introduction paragraphs. 
Use the types of introduction paragraphs explained in the elements modules to have students practice writing. For more basic introduction purposes, you may want to start out with the five W's. But you want to ask them what they want to do, how do they want to grab the, writer's, I mean, the reader's attention. The type of introduction chosen will be based on the purpose for their expository essay. So why are they trying to explain this topic in the first place? What are they trying to accomplish? Remember, a well-written essay will also have uh, some type of persuasive undertone. So whenever you're using the different types of uh, conclusion, I mean, conclusion paragraphs, ask the students what type of effect or impression do you want to leave on the reader. So the type of conclusion chosen will be based on the emotional, logical, or ethical effect of their expository essay. Do they want them to leave with some kind of positive or negative impression? So basically, at the end of the day, I want to sh just want to show you a few ways to take research-based information or non-student-friendly resources and turn them into something that's comprehensible for students. So I'm going to give you a couple of moments. We're going to do a 3 2 one wrap-up. So you'll need a piece of paper for this. This is more or less for your purposes. I want you to write down three big ideas you learned from the presentation. Next, I want you to write down two ideas you still want to ponder that were presented today. And lastly, I want you to write down one action to take immediately that you learn from today's presentation. Hey, to access the presentation and resources, please type in the following uh, link. I will give you a few moments in order in which to copy this down. It is very case sensitive. Give you like another couple of seconds to copy this down or you can take a picture of it. I hope this training has helped you with understanding practices and strategies to use when using elements of expository writing activities in the classroom. Thank you for joining me today. Be sure to follow me on Twitter. This will help you stay in the know about state issues and developments as well as helping you stay current about the latest educational topics. If you need to contact me, my information is listed. Once again, thank you for joining me today.